Welcome to Stories with Briscoe and Bradshaw. I would be Bradshaw. That would be the WWE Hall of Famer and Oklahoma's favorite son, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. And this man just needs one line to introduce him. The greatest intercontinental champion of all time. <laughs> and there's no dispute about it. He's the honky talk man. Mr. Honky, Boy. good to see you. Well, I tell you what, you finally got it right. I mean, most people don't ever say that like that, but uh, you put the emphasis on it. That like, like me and Gene would do the greatest intercontinental champion of all time. Well, I'm going to uh, do it right way. I'm cool. I'm cocky. I'm bad. I'm a honky dog, man. I'm coming to your town. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I tell you what, uh, it's like I was saying, you, you say that thing long enough, people start believing it, I guess. <laughs> I'm kind of hey. like, like that. My, I'm kind of like that my pillow guy. The more you see it on TV, the more you start believing it. <laughs> way, way, man. It's, it's great, great to see you. You and I go back, you know, before, way before even Layfield even came along man that's yeah, a long time yeah, ago and yeah. happy birthday happy birthday to uh to my, my fellow uh uh man over there don bradshaw layfield who happens to share a birthday with one of your cousins jerry the king and Lawler, and another great friend of yours uh the great dutch mantel so happy birthday to the three from there all week long so so a happy birthday but but this wait, is a, yeah. Let's go. Yeah. It's a small we, community here now yeah, sure <laughs> we, we, it is we we go back into I think the the, the late seventies or maybe even early eighties when you first made your way down here. But but your your story a lot of people think all of a sudden you just showed up at WWF and you're the honky tonk man. But there was a long what ten twelve year yeah. building process yeah. to get yeah. there, and it all started out with you training with with some true legends and. And I kind of heard the story, and I know the I know the fact that, as you said, that it's true because you trained in a barn, air air conditioned barn with the cows and and horses. They had to, if you wanted to water or fresh yourself over, you just went over the horse trough and and washed yourself yeah. off. Yeah, but they, you got you got some of the greatest training. You got that good old Southern training and put you ready to become world famous honky tonk man. Tell us a little bit about that 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 uh, beginning with you. Yeah, that's uh, uh, Herb Welch, the, the Welch family, the Fullers. Uh, he Herb trained me. I trained up in his barn up there in uh, Dyersburg, Tennessee. I started training when I got out of college. I graduated in, in uh, December of 75 from- uh, Now, this is Memphis, right? Memphis yeah, University, Memphis. right? And then uh, uh, about midway through, I'd be graduating in December, and I graduate with a, a physical education degree. And, it, it's hard to get hired on teaching in a, in a mid year like that. So there was no jobs available, nothing. So I, I, I kind of stayed in school and started working on a master's and that wasn't really what I wanted to do. And a couple of my buddies had started training up there with Herb and, and of course, Jerry being my cousin, Jerry Lawler, his mother, my mother's sisters were sisters, both passed away now. Uh, he was doing quite well over there in Memphis and, uh, and, and uh, with, the wrestling and I never really considered it that much because I wanted to teach and coach and then uh, I went up there with those boys one Sunday night in Herb's barn and heck that, that pro wrestling bit me I mean it I was <laughs> up. Uh, and that was it and uh, and then uh, Herb being uh, you know in the Welch family and with every all the contacts they had across the south, which was just about every territory. They, they, they owned they owned every territory, they, or they, they had, had a everything. piece of every every, every Yeah, they had somebody south. either a brother or a sister yeah. or uh, uh, somebody was working in an office somewhere. So I, I was never out of work. And uh, Herb was a real good trainer. Herb was probably one of the better of the Welches the, of the workers of the old time Welch family. Mm -hmm. You know, Buddy Fuller was a good worker. And Robert Ron became good workers, and Jackie Welch did too, and Roy Lee, all those guys that came along. Oh. But uh, the old timers, Herb was probably the best. But Roy was a, the promoter, and he was in Nashville at the time. So uh, just saying that you were trained by Herb Welch opened a lot of doors for you. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what did how you it happened. Coach, I was a high school football coach. Did, did you did you actually start coaching at one point? Yeah, that? yeah, I coached for uh, two seasons, and then uh, I resigned. <laughs> this is something I, I trained with her. I trained with her for about nine months, and the Coco was there training with me. My other cousin Carl Fergie, he had gone through there, mm -hmm. and my partner that I had when uh, 
I met up uh, uh, with Jerry and them down in Tampa, uh, Larry Booker, Larry Latham. He went through there, and uh, David Schultz had gone through there the year before me, Dr. D. David Schultz. So Herb trained a lot of good guys. But uh, 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 I resigned from teaching. Herb got me booked for Speedy Hatfield in uh, Mobile, in the Mobile Territory. This was before it was Pensacola. And I resigned from my teaching and coaching job, man. And uh, we had a, a Christmas reunion type thing at one of my aunt's houses in Memphis. And Lawler was there. He came by. And he said, how's the resident going? I said, well, it's OK. I resigned from teaching. I'm going to start in Mobile next week. He said, they did, Herb didn't tell you? Said, what? They closed the territory. What? And my, <laughs> man, I'll tell you what. It was like, are you kidding me? He said, no. <laughs> and, uh, but I hadn't talked to Herb. I, I was getting my bags packed. I was leaving. I thought I was, you know, I was going out on the road, man. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be somebody. And then I, he Lawler said, well, you know, if you want to, you can come to work for us. And uh, I can give you some TV work. I said, okay, when? He said, how about tomorrow? Okay. So I went <laughs> to Memphis TV and called Herb the next day. And I said, what's going on there with that deal in Mobile? And he said, oh, man. I meant to tell you, he closed the territory. So, well, that's that. That don't help me very much, Herb. I mean, for Christ's sakes, I said, well, can you get me in Nashville or somewhere? And they were having a falling out, uh, Herb and uh, and Jerry, uh, Herb and Nick Goulas and Jerry Jack and those guys. And so you, 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 you just quit your job coaching, right? So, yes, I so you were, wow, wow, you're stuck in the middle of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and anyway, Lawler gave me the TV job and I went over there and worked a couple of times under a mask and then worked as myself, you know, did the normal TV stuff. And, and uh, then he said, uh, I said, well, are you going to be able to use me? I don't have a place to go. But back to the Herb story, Herb told me don't go to Nashville. He didn't want me to work up there for Nick because they were had started. They were starting to split away then where Jerry Jarrett took the territory from Nick down on that, that end of Memphis. And you, you know, that story, of right. uh, Jerry. Right. And uh, so anyway, and Herb ran a town for uh, for Jerry Jarrett and for Nick back then, Blyville, Arkansas. And he said, well, if worse comes to worse, you can just work for me every Friday night in Blyville. Well, Friday, one night a week, wasn't that, you know, that wasn't going to pay my bills. But anyway, I, I hung on there with, with Lawler and them. And uh, finally, uh, Lawler didn't do much with me. You know, he behaved, had me under a mask here and drive 500 miles one way to Louisville and couldn't ride with anybody because I wasn't on a I wasn't on the loop with everybody. And, and then Jerry Jarrett took over about midway through that year. And that's when he sent me down to, to uh, Tampa. You guys were having yeah. that. Uh, well, way, way back, back up there. Time. Yeah, back up there right before you leave the Tampa. Now, you said uh, uh, Jarrett took over. They had the strangest booking uh, routine of any place I've ever seen. Yeah. Just in the middle of a program, in the middle of the week, no yeah. matter what day it was, they had it six months. Another guy would drop his book, uh, take 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 his books, bring them in, and push the other guy's books aside. That had to be so confusing with the talent because each yeah. one of those guys are going to have their favorites, no matter what's going on. Well, yeah, because if if Jerry Jerry uh, wanted some guys, he would use those guys, and if Jerry Lawler had guys, and Lawler wanted these, so yeah, it was a mess. And you know, Robert and Ron did the same thing. Right. Robert would take over from Ron and then Robert would give it to Bob Armstrong and then Bob would have it for two months and then Ron would come back. <laughs> and, but yeah, so, but I got a pretty good education, but I got sent down there with you guys and they saw uh, Larry is the first time I'd ran across him. And for the folks out there listening, Larry uh, Latham, he was named then for, he was working in Atlanta for Ole. He became spot moon dog. For all the WWE fans out there, uh, but Ole sent him down for you because you guys needed a for having a big tag team tournament. Right over in, in St. Petersburg at the Bayfront Center. Yeah, right. someone had sent me the card the other day uh, because I mentioned I was coming on your show and they they mailed it to me and I saw it. But uh, we wrestled you and Jack, and uh, you guys got disqualified. Dropped me over top rope. We, but anyway, we dropped we. We went into the finals and, and uh, the belts went to Pac Song and Killer Khan. That's who took the belts there. Right. And then you were booking, I think you were booking at the time because you had called Jarrett and needed somebody and he sent me. Right. And yeah. uh, then we came back. You wanted to keep us and we came back down there. And then Buddy, Buddy Rogers took over. 
right during that period of time and then uh what that's a whole different story with him yeah and, <laughs> he didn't last very long either so <laughs> no business went, went straight to hell and you know he and, and i think that's when i called you in and i did this to several of the guys that i saw that had talent because you know buddy 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 was jealous because you guys had that nice blonde hair. I mean, I John, uh, this is this is a true story, and uh, it happened on a lot of these guys that had the blonde hair. But anyway, I, I called you in. I said, "Man, you got a lot of talent. If uh, if you stay here, all this guy's going to do is beat you on TV every week." And and, and I and yeah. I'm thinking, you know, man, I want to make some money with this guy, but I know I know Rogers don't and that's over that but the best place for him to get out while he was still young in the business without getting you know established as as a as an enhancement guy was to get the hell out of Dodge for a while. You know yep, and so I, buddy, I uh, made made a couple phone calls for you. He uh he was be, he was squashing all the top guys down there in like 10, yeah. 15 seconds and he was like running wild. I couldn't, it was like, I couldn't believe Eddie was letting him do it, but, but he did it. And, and then, uh, did you say, did you stay long enough to see him, uh, uh, destroy Pedro Morales with those uh, 90 minute matches with, uh, Lars Anderson, 90 and two hour matches? No, no, I, I was, he, he oh was, oh my he, God. <laughs> he was beating everyone down there back then in 10, 15, 20 seconds, yeah. go out there and attack them and put your figure four on them, one, two, three, and, and uh yeah it was uh yeah favorite anyway. finish slip on a banana pill yeah i guess so uh, i <laughs> loved it down there i really did I, I i never got a chance to go back because when we left when we left there then and and uh we stopped in ocala and and larry called uh, Oli to see if we could get in there and Oli said i don't have a spot for you but jerry jarrett everyone the fullers were working for jarrett back then and tanaka and fuji George George Jr., the list goes on and on. Tony Charles, all those guys are working. And Jimmy Golden, of course, Robert Ron. The whole territory, Stomper, they up and gave Jerry like a three-day notice and left and went back to Knoxville. And uh, Ole said, Jerry Jarrett needs somebody right now. So we called Jerry Jarrett. I did because I knew Jerry. And he says, yeah, I can use you guys. When can you get here? We said, we'll be there tomorrow night. And we started in, uh, in uh, Tupelo, that Friday night. And that's when we did that concession stand thing. Yeah, just out of the blue. So it all fell into place, uh, uh, Jerry. You know, when you, right? I, I've had so many, I have a lot of doors that's closed, but every time one closed, something will open up. Yeah. And uh, and that's how it went. You mentioned the concession match. That's probably one of the, one of the most historic matches in the South, and it was hardcore before hardcore it became was awesome. hardcore. It was awesome. <laughs> I, I, just found, it. Hunky, I just found it on YouTube and watched it wow. this morning. It, that match was freaking awesome. We didn't know match. anything about it, nothing. Jerry Jarrett came in the locker room, and uh, he said, fellas, we got to do something. They all left. We got nobody. <laughs> he said, you guys in the tag match tonight go three falls, and at the end of the third fall, just tear the building up. Go in the concession stand, tear everything up. What? Okay. Uh -uh. We didn't know anything. We were just, you know, we had, Larry and I had, had only worked together in Tampa for a few tag matches down there for about four, five, six weeks. And then here we're all with Lawler and Dundee, and man, I'll tell you what, it was, it was really something. They always, they would always film. It wasn't, it didn't just happen that they filmed it that night. Uh, uh, periodically, uh, the TV people, Lance Russell, would come there uh, and they would film on that fr on the Friday night out of Tupelo and grab some footage for the Saturday TV show. So it wasn't like they were planning to be there because they would typically were there every Friday night anyway, grabbing some kind of footage or something. And uh, it happened. Lance Lance didn't really know about it either. Uh, Jerry Jarrett, I don't know when he thought about it or how or where, but he he did it and it it popped that place wide open we had turn away crowds for six months couldn't uh, they showed it on memphis tv that saturday morning we went to jonesboro arkansas and the building wouldn't hold but about 400 people and there was four thousand lined up it was the darndest thing and and it went on for a long time yeah and the business the business popped right away i mean it was right it, after that was shown the business yeah it, 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 yeah within well <laughs> it showed on tv at 11 o'clock in the morning on saturday morning and uh by six o'clock that night, the buildings were all they were sold out everywhere, turned people away. Then, then Jerry Jarrett got to he's 
he got us working with Nick a little bit more. Nick was crying, and Nick's territory was going to heck up there and drawing nothing. So he said, would you please send them boys up there and let's do it up here. So we went up to Nashville and did it and uh, went around with Nick and did the whole thing up there. Yeah, and a whole other territory. territory. How did the territory work? You had you had Memphis running, you had Nashville running, and then you had uh, Knoxville running also, which Mulligan ended up taking over, right? Yeah, so I went over there. I, yeah, that that was that. That's a whole other story too. <laughs> but you had you had three different territories in Tennessee, basically, right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And the, then the well, no, because Knoxville was not Nick Nick Goulas never had Knoxville. Uh, that was always that was a, 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 a another guy had it uh, before, and he ran mostly out of Knoxville and then over in uh, Kentucky and and West Virginia in that area, and Ron Ron Fuller uh, bought that thing, took it from him. I, I don't know if Fuller's ever bought anything. They usually just went in, like Nick said, "Why do you want to buy something when you can steal it?" So <laughs> <laughs> much easier that way. <laughs> and, then, and Nick was an expert on that. Like I, 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 honk, honk, you know, with, uh, you're, you're talking about all these guys leaving in, 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 in that area there. Was, was that a part of that takeover when they act with Roop and uh, Ronnie Garvin and all those guys doing the nope. expose? That, 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 happened, that happened later on then, I, I think. Uh, that, was, that was later on because they, uh, that's when uh, – uh, Randy Savage's dad, uh, Angelo Popo, and those guys had opened up over there in Kentucky, and we're going to try to run opposition. So that's when Bob Bob Roop and those guys took off on Ron Fuller. Ron, it's like I said, there was a things going on over there with the with the Roy Welch because Roy had gotten in bad health and 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 couldn't function anymore, and they put him in a home and. Buddy was Buddy came over there and tried to take it over and help Nick and then work with Jerry Jarrett. And then Buddy ended up leaving Nick and Nick ended up just by himself. And and then Ron came over to work with Jerry Jarrett and they had a falling out. So Ron up and left, took everybody and went to Knoxville. So it was the, it was the family and politics that just don't <laughs> get in. Family politics and business don't work. They just don't work. And when you got the Fuller family, you get the heck, you got about a hundred of them. They're all over the country. <laughs> and, and, and you got to have a program to know which was a Fuller or a Welch or a Fargo or a Green or whatever the heck. Well, yeah, program. because see, like I said, Speedy, I was going down for Speedy Hatfield. Now, Speedy was married to uh, Herb and Roy's uh, uh, sister. That's how the Hatfields were involved down there <laughs> in, in Mobile and Pensacola. And then, uh, Jimmy Golden's daddy, Bill Golden. Bill Golden, to, yeah. Bill had the Birmingham territory. He had Birmingham yeah. and Montgomery and those towns. And so, <laughs> and then Roy, uh, Jackie Welch, Jackie, uh, Jack Welch, he had some, he had Mississippi and Vicksburg and Jackson, Meridian, yeah. those places. And uh, Roy Lee and Jackie, which is his sons, Jackie ran Tallahassee. You know Jackie, because you guys yeah. used to go up for Jackie in Tallahassee. Right. right. And uh, so that's, uh, and then what, uh, a th what Lester, a Thanksgiving that what a Thanksgiving that had to be. Yeah, and the Lester worked in you guys' office yeah. in Tampa. Yeah, Le Lester has the reputation of of getting mugged in the Bahamas. You, you did you work the Bahamas for us when you were no, down there? No, I never got down there. But no. you you probably heard those stories. You know, we would charter an airplane over, and, and Lester would go over, and he'd make the deals uh, and all that stuff. He, he got beat up three times carrying a briefcase that had to had the gate receipts on it. So guys, well, we're sorry. We got no money. <laughs> uh, well, it's something about the Bahamas and the Welches. You know, uh, Ron ended up down there for a while, too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Very mysterious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you want to tell us that? <laughs> uh, I, I, he just, Ron would just up and be gone sometimes. And then they'd say, what happened to Ron? Well, he, he just sold the territory or, He's running a hockey team, and no, he sold that, and uh, yeah, it was uh, always something. I don't even know how Mulligan. Uh, uh, John just brought up Mulligan in Nash in in Knoxville. Oh, but Jim Barnett, Jack Jim Barnett, Jim Barnett, uh, Fuller would have trouble, so they wanted Barnett to buy it, and uh, and uh, Barnett because of the TV obligation, Barnett uh, couldn't swing it because of some type of TV, so. He got uh, blackjack, and I think Flair was involved, and 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 one one other person. I'm not sure on the details, 
but they ended up buying it. They tried it, tried to run it. And, you know, back in those days, especially when you got three guys that are owning the territory and they all want to be on top, you got some, you got some issues. <laughs> yeah. And, they, the and their TV, I went over there with Kevin Sullivan. Kevin and I were attacked. We're uh, uh, in Memphis together. And uh, then Kevin wanted to get back home. His wife and family was living in Knoxville at the time. And so he's, he, he was being with Mulligan and those guys. So uh, I ended up leaving Jarrett and going over with him to Knoxville. And uh, the TV, we were getting mostly tapes out of Charlotte. So they were seeing a lot of Charlotte guys and not us, not the, the Knox, the, the, the Mulligan people. So the towns just, they just weren't drawing at all. They were terrible. And now mind you, Jack, like you said, he, Jack thought, Flair would always come and help, but Flair didn't ever show up at all. But Jack, he he would book something like Dick the Bruiser and uh, and Bruiser Brody against him and John Jack Mulligan and John Stud. Well, you got four, you got four folks out there that ain't, they they want him sell eye gouges, you know. They just, and uh, I don't, it just didn't work. And it not well, the, the the fan the fans in Knoxville and that Tennessee area they were used to seeing guys that could go. I'm yeah. not just standing there and punch and yeah. kick and then yeah. high gouge. They were yeah. guys just guy like you and, and yeah. Latham and yeah. and all all the guys that were moving around and Morton. I mean, what a, what a sudden lineup they had there. Yeah, they even the Fuller, even the Fullers as big as they were, they realized that you had to work there. You realized you had to sell them bop and no more. Yeah, the, that whole area over there had been indoctrinated with that the Fullerism. And yeah. when you work within the Fullers, you know, they, they, they you worked and you put on these, right. you put on a good show and, and they had a lot going on over there at the time. And, and, uh, but Jack could, Jack could never get going. And he called us in one day. He said, boys, he said, uh, he said, I just can't afford to pay you anymore. And <laughs> he said, what do you guys want to do? And Bobby Eaton said, well, Jack, if you can't afford to pay me. I can't afford to stay. And he looked at me, he said, Wayne, what about you? I said, well, I'm kind of with Bobby, I guess. I'd be, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so, we we ended up leaving and but, but uh he jack had some good boys over there he terry yeah. taylor it was his first territory uh uh barry got started there barry was was just getting started he was barry Wyndham was one of the best titles ever seen uh and uh, yeah. uh he was erica bundy came over there but he came down it was his first territory bundy had long brown hair and big impressive guy and and uh and so, yeah, there, Tim Horner was over there and the, those boys were around Knoxville. Some, it was some good talent there at the time, but we just didn't have the power of the television uh, to, to keep us going. And, and they how were seeing the Charlotte get, guys, so, and they weren't getting Charlotte right. guys. They were and seeing Ole and Gene going, and all that stuff. How'd you end up going to uh, Puerto Rico? Did you go to Puerto Rico from there? And, and Larry Latham didn't go with you to Puerto Rico, right? You no, Larry and, I, Larry and I busted up there, and it's the last time I saw Larry. Never saw him again. Never ran across really? him again. Yeah, we, was in, we were in Nashville. And we were over in Nashville working for Nick, and uh, this was before the Knoxville thing, and Dutch, <laughs> Dutch Mantel, you mentioned Dutch earlier. <laughs> Dutch, was, uh, Dutch was going back to Puerto Rico. Him and Cowboy Frankie Lane had a big run down there a, a year or so before. But Frankie, they didn't want Frankie back down there for Frankie Lane. It's a, Jerry knows him very well. And mm. the story's on Frankie, which nobody right. wants to keep Frankie around too long. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he, he'd get in trouble no matter what. And so anyway, Dutch was going to take Dennis Condry. And they had promo Dennis Condry and had his pictures in the programs, the magazines, everything down there. And then Dennis up at the last minute said he wasn't going. And so Dutch was stuck and Dutch asked me to go. And I said, I don't know Dutch. I said, you know, I got this thing with Larry and we've been doing okay. And, and he said, man, do you want to make some money? You want to stay up here with Nick? And I, that's about all he had to say. <laughs> because, <laughs> yeah. back, to, back then everybody was paying 50 bucks a night, Jerry. And, and uh, I know. Uh, and, and, and Nick, and Nick, 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 you were lucky Nick was if you still got paying 20. <laughs> I mean, Nick was, Nick was still paying like 20 or 30 and, you know, and you say, Nick, I can't live on this. I damn boy, it ain't what you make, what you save, which I learned a valuable lesson with that. And I've used it a lot since then. But uh, I went down to Puerto Rico uh, with Dutch and uh, stayed down there for about 10 months. It was a good run. It was a real good run down there. 
Who was your program against down there? Dutch. We worked against we worked against invaders. Invaders one and two, mostly, right. and then Carlos periodically back and forth. Victor Jubik and Carlos, uh -huh. they they you know it was a small territory, so they had to rotate guys in and out. Yeah. The only uh, thing I didn't like the only thing I didn't like about it, Jerry, was when you had you worked your butt off to to draw a big house at a big show at the stadium. At, at, at Clemente or in Bayamon or one of those big stadiums. Labrell, yeah. Yeah, and then they bring Abby in for that. They bring the Funks in for that. They bring somebody. It's like, man, come on, Carlos, give us a little bit of that cheese. <laughs> yeah. But that's just how they did it, and that's how it works. <coughs> and you learn to live with it. But uh, when I got down there, Crazy Luke Graham was there. Fuji was there. They had been doing real good business together, all them. And uh, <coughs> Uh, then the two Japanese boys came in, uh, Onita, which was Baba's boy, and, and that, that boy Fuji. And so they were there with us and Dutch, and then the sheep herders came, and they rotated talent there about every eight or nine months. It, it was and a that, good territory, too. I mean, yeah, they, yeah, well, they, they drew. It Car drew good. <laughs> yeah. It drew Car good. I worked, we only worked four days one week, and three days the next. So it was a, you know, it was a vacation, and you got paid. I mean, you put your life on the line every night, but. <laughs> <laughs> and you did tell us about some of you. You know, yeah, I got to get on here. <clears throat> you know, tell them about some of the matches with with Terry on the, the heat of Terry and Abdullah. I mean, when when it didn't matter if you're baby faced or heel. When you walked to that ring, you were you were literally putting your life life in. in, in it was a, every in night. Life. Yeah. Every was, every yeah. night. Yeah. And, and everywhere you were on the island, because yeah. the, the, everyone on the everyone that was there was over on that island. Everyone, <coughs> Carlos was a god there, right? And Victor Victor Jovica was a god. Mm. I mean, it's hard to say about Victor, but he was too. I mean, everyone there was like uh, it was. They were like Babe Ruth of, of baseball yeah. on that island. Uh. These guys were. Everybody was over there, <laughs> and it was such. A, and it's a small place. Uh, I, it, it was. Oh. They would throw, they had, I know why they're good baseball players. Them kids got good arms on them, man. They can throw a rock and hit you from, from 100 yards away. <laughs> never seen like. uh, they were good. They were good. They would throw uh, 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 size D batteries. They'd throw spark plugs. It was, <laughs> okay. Here's a Southern boy. You, you were born in the South. You worked uh, your, most of your career in the South. And then uh, you end up in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. What a culture shock. And war, I mean, what? You had to be a, uh, out of place there, Wade. <laughs> Jerry, I left Pensacola. <laughs> and I had cowboy boots, blue jeans, and my high school jacket. That had some thick sleeves on it. That's the only winter clothes I had. I'd never been north of the Mason Dixon line. You know, Louisville, Kentucky was Louisville, but yeah. Louisville as far as I didn't was know. North. I went to St. Louis once and did TV up there and uh, uh did TV job up there in St. Louis. That's that's the first time I'd ever been to St. Louis, you know. I mean like I I landed up there, I drove up there, I left Pensacola and I drove three days and I got up there and it was thirty-five below zero. <laughs> Stu Hart met me out on his porch at his house and didn't invite me in where it was warm. Kept me out there for over an hour. I couldn't, I couldn't feel my anything. My hands and face was frozen, and he was putting holes on me. And uh, no, hey, it was something else. And you know, and then of course, I never went to Texas for the Von Erics because I was in when I went to to Japan out of Puerto Rico. Killer Brooks was on that tour. And I said, how's Dallas? Because I was looking for a place to go. And, and Brooks put his hand up like that. And I said, well, I, I can do the claw. He said, no, it's that much or less a week. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I said, oh, really? OK, I don't, I've been for Nick. I, I knew what that was. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so anyway, so, uh, and so plus, kill, you kill, know. Because I, I, I worked for Killer a lot. I worked with Killer a lot. So Killer, Killer <laughs> didn't like the payoffs under the old Von Eric regime, right? No, oh, well, no, that's what he told me. Was he said, and I thought he meant taking the claw. Well, I just said, well, I can take the claw. I was like, he had me, I'm sitting on a bus, you know, and we're all drinking beer. 
And, uh, and I'm looking for a place to go. And he told me about that. And I'm thinking, okay. But then he said it was that much or less a week. So that means 500 or less per week. So, uh, yeah, and uh, with all the kids there and everything, no. And also up, five boys that you had to get around, too. Yeah, yeah, then, yeah, 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 then all the kids, you got to all the kids. So I ended up, so I go up to Calgary. It was worse because I just Stu had more kids. There's more of them. There a dozen of them up there. And they was all working. They all wanted to be bookers. And they was all calling finishes. And holy cow. But it was, yeah, it was a culture shock is not the word for it. Uh, the exchange on the money. Uh, Stu never told me about that when he booked me up there. So we had, we had issues right from the get-go. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying, Calgary, what, what for the season? <laughs> yeah, and in the summers, I mean, you know, all the boys left and went over to the Maritimes and worked over there all the way across the country. And I wasn't going to drive away over there for, you know, another 500 a week or less. And so, so I just stayed in Calgary and Stu, you know what Stu paid me? He gave me my guarantee. Every week I got that money. He gave me a raise because we started drawing right away. And that's the first place I carried this black hair and the jumpsuit and, and the whole thing. Once I, the Fullers let me do it there and get it started. And then uh, when I took it up to Calgary, uh, uh, the fans up there went crazy over it, and uh, and and we started drawing. And Stu would pay you. If you which were drawing, which, which you. boys? Which boys were you working with at that time? Ross and all uh, uh, Leo Burke was Leo. up there. He was he was one of their mainstays. Brett and Jim, Jim Brett and Jim was there. Dynamite and Davy was there. Bad News was there. So there's some David awesome Schultz talent there. there then, right? Duke Duke Myers was there. I knew Duke from uh, Nashville. Duke, Duke, uh, uh, Carrie, Carrie Brown, Bob Brown's uh, uh, nephew. Uh, uh, Jerry Marl, uh, 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 Jamaican fella. Uh, good talent. Wow, well, you, you had a really good talent up there. And then we had the English boys there. Some English guys were really good. Uh, uh, the Japanese boy, Ito, which he was down with Saito in Tampa. Right, right. For you guys yeah. early, early on. And uh, he was up there. And they were, you know, Calgary was a good place because you'd end up, you could go to Europe out there, you could go to Germany, you could go to England, you could go to uh, uh, to Japan uh, if you wanted to. But I stayed, I just stayed there in the summer. But Stu said, if you stay in the summer, I'll run some towns. But he'd run Calgary and Edmonton, and maybe we'd work two, three days a week, and I still got my guarantee, and it worked out okay. Uh, I ended up being up there when uh, they had the big show in Calgary, July the 4th at Stampede. And right, Hogan, at Stampede. Huck, Huck came into town, and uh, the big crew came in from uh, WWE. And uh, that's when I saw Terry again. I hadn't seen him since uh, Memphis and Pensacola. And uh, he told me about coming over there with them guys and huh. said he'd have Vince call me. And huh. Next morning, Vince called me, and I got hired. Wow. So tell us about that. So your hair was turning black at that time. You did left the, the blonde, uh, had, yeah. had, the, had the chops come out yeah. yet. So you, you yeah. had the jump. So, so you had were, the, you were trans, yeah. you were transforming. And it was that in your mind to transform like that. I, I, I know you, you, yeah. you picked up the, the deal from the old honky talk, uh, yeah. man song yeah. Uh, yeah. from years ago. Yeah. I, I didn't have the Elvis thing in mind at all, Jerry. I was one. I was going to do, you know, with the wife beater shirt on and this pencil thin mustache, this slimy hair, like this fella on this TV show was a maintenance guy, Snyder, on this show one day at a time. A very popular show one time right. back then. And but I needed a name for it. The name I picked up off of that song. But then going back on TV. The way I ended up with the black hair was I did a hair dye match. You know, typically in the wrestling business, a hair cut match. You know, somebody's going to lose their hair. It was me and Austin Idol. And uh, we did the interviews and stuff about there's only room here for one guy with blonde hair. It's, I'm going to get rid of you, Idol. I'm going to have you. You're going to have green hair and orange hair. Anyway, I went around the territory, and we did that every night for six nights. And I spray painted the hair at the end and came back on TV with black hair. So some fans there in, in Birmingham saw the way I looked and asked me about doing the Elvis thing. I did. I said, no, you know, Bill Dundee does that. Somebody else is doing that. I don't care about it. And 
they ended up fixing making me a jumpsuit and brought it to me about two weeks later and robert fuller saw it said man you know anything about a guitar and i said no i don't know anything about it good that's even better so, <laughs> so <laughs> he, said, he said man i tell you what i'll bring this guitar i got one at home i'll bring it over here you hit bob armstrong man we'll be off and running and that's what i did yeah wow gave bob a whacking across the back with tv and popped that place and stayed there for four or five months and then worked on it and took it to calgary he, so the yeah. fans made you the jumpsuit yeah yeah that's you know i've always said this listen to what these fans want if i told stone cold this we're sitting over there in that restaurant in in by the uh philadelphia airport that the, uh, the denny's restaurant down from where we'd all go out there and he said these fans are cheering for me man i I want to be a heel. I, I don't. I, I don't know what to do. They're cheering everything I do. I said, Steve, just keep doing what you're doing. Do this. Do the same thing. Don't change it. If they want to cheer for you, just keep just keep doing it. Let them switch you. I said, if they switch you, they're gonna love you no matter what. So he kept doing the finger and the hell yeah and all the stuff, and it worked for him. You know, instead of him just trying to go out and low rate them or say bad things about them. Uh, uh, so the fans. They automatically, as soon as I put that jumpsuit on, those people hated my guts. And I, I was a heel anyway. I'd never been a baby face. So it came easy for me. And I was always, you know, I was an introvert in school. I'd never say a word. I wouldn't raise my hand until I, I was in college. I'd take a public speaking class and had to stand up speak. And then after teaching and coaching, I had to learn how to talk to folks. But then I just worked on this gift of gab and, I found the little key words and phrases to say that would just make them mad. And I, I tell you what, it was tough, man. People want to kill me. They want to kill me before I even got to WWE. I mean, it was, they want to kill me in Mobile and Pensacola. I was fighting every night down there, but I, I mean, I knew how to do it because I've been in Puerto Rico, so I didn't mind that. <laughs> <laughs> were you, you know, a young man in Pensacola when Hogan and Beefcake first came in? No, I wasn't. No, uh, uh You were no, I was down there as punk rock. I had I had hair spiked up and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And Bob Armstrong would call me skunk rock because I had a white streak in there like Sputnik. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, Louis Tillette brought Hogan in there. That's who brought Hogan to Pensacola, Louis. Yeah, well, Louis I, 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 I called, I called, uh, I called Louis and asked him to bring him in there when when the yeah. same thing I did for you because he, you know he, JV Johnny Valentine was was booking in and he didn't have a clue what we we're gonna do with Hogan and uh, another guy just didn't want to see him beat 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 so I, I Louis had just left here yeah Louis was down Florida. with you guys yeah yeah so yeah. I called Louis and I said Louis you know that big kid we we had you want it hell yes I want him. <laughs> Yeah, he did. You know, they get, Ron and him got him over good. He drew he drew one hell of a house down there in uh, in Dothan, Alabama, with Harley Race. He, they was at the football stadium there and turned people away. Sixteen, eighteen thousand people they packed in there for that thing. Yeah, it was it was wow. a big deal. He got over. I knew the minute I saw him though, Jerry. The minute I yeah. saw this boy walk in, he he had he had this thing about him. Yeah. He had. I mean, he had money dripping off of him. Yeah. <laughs> he, yeah. he, he, it, it was like looking, it, it was like looking at that boy for the rock this is the dwayne johnson that kid i mean he had money dripping off of him at 12 years old he just <laughs> was that kind of kid <laughs> you so know, when some hogan, guys some they just have it some guys have it so when hogan sees you up in calgary at the big show that was the first time he had seen you with the black hair and the new gimmick since pensacola well, I still had the blonde hair down there. I just had it different colors, but uh, yeah, no, he had, he had not seen me with the black hair. He didn't. He had never seen that gimmick. So when when, when, he, when, he, saw you in Cal when he saw you in Calgary at the big show, that's when the first time he saw you with the black hair and the and the honky tonk gimmick. Yes, that was the first time he'd seen me. Then it was like, holy hell, man, what the heck happened to you? I said, I don't know. He said, What are you doing up here? I said, I'm up here in cold storage, man. I, I said, told you. Down. I'm in a deep freeze. He said, you don't need to be here. You need to be with us. I said, man, I don't know if I'm ready to go over there. He said, shit, you're as ready as anybody else. He said, Vincent, but he, he'll love this thing you doing. I said, well, I don't know. I'll give it a try. I mean, he said, I'll have him call you in the morning. And he, he'd been when, seven it, 
when he called you, was it was it much of a sell job? Of course, he probably already had Terry's word. Hey, we want this guy, and he gave making some money. But did uh, when you were telling him the gimmick, was he was he how would how was his response to? You know, he, he told me he said I don't know a lot about it. He said I just know that the, he said the Hulkster told me that you guys know each other from way back, and and uh, he he thinks you can come in here and we can do something. And I said, well, I sure like to give it a shot. He uh, he said, okay, how about Wednesday? you uh, we'll send you a plane ticket bring me a tape so he said i don't care a lot about matches on the tape i don't care about that i want to see you talk he said i need some interview and i happened to have one that i had done about two weeks before that and i would take the my my wife would take the shows for me because i never got to see them on tv because tv was showing calgary on saturday and we'd be on the road going to edmund so i never got to see it so i invested in a video tape machine to take the matches so I could watch them back. And uh, and I put together a tape of a short little clip of me beating this boy around with a guitar. And uh, and I had about a three minute interview, Jerry, of just me talking, of just me out there with the dressed in the gimmick, the whole works and me just selling myself and everything. And uh, that's what Vince wanted. He, he needed, Vince needs people that can carry that interview time. It's that's what it's about. I mean, you know that, Jerry. He, he Bottom line, that's out, what when when you throw somebody out there for them two minute and forty eight seconds that they have, you you better have somebody that can talk. And 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 uh, that's he saw that. And then I want to make you a baby face. I see this, and Vince is a visionary. There's a, there's a few people around like him. Uh, you know, Bill Gates, visionary. He wanted to put a computer in everybody's house. Hell, he's put 10 computers in everybody's house. Uh, this Richard Branson, them kind of people, uh, uh, visionaries. They see things we don't see. And Vince sees things that, that other, you know, we question it at all time. What the heck is he thinking about? But he, he doesn't see stuff like we see. And I just said, Vince, I've never, I have not, this thing's made for heel. I said, I don't even know how to be a baby face. I'm, I, I can lead the baby faces around. That's all I've ever done. I know how to do that, but no, no. I can see kids with jumpsuits and little guitar finger guitars. And uh, I said, I don't know if I can make it work. Yeah, we'll, we'll. it didn't work. <laughs> he, 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 he's thinking merchandise and you're thinking heat. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to draw, I'm trying to sell some tickets because I don't need a job. I yeah, knew how to, I knew what I needed to do to sell tickets, and it was go out there and talk bad to these folks, and tell them how great I was, and how what's a good singer and a dancer, and all these things I was, and and to make them mad. And the darndest thing was Jerry, I didn't know it at the time. The TV, the first TV tapings he put me on, we did them out of out of Toronto, over there in that what was it, Brampton, Brampford, Ontario. Right over there, where we did, the, we used to do the tapes there. We didn't Poughkeepsie one week, and then they'd go to Canada a week or two weeks later. Well, I had been on Vancouver TV, which was like Turner's Television in Atlanta. It went all the way across the country. I'd been over there for almost six or eight months, and they had seen this gimmick in Canada, and they hated it. And he throws me out there on that TV, and in, 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 uh, in, just outside of Toronto, and there's ten thousand people booing the shit out of me. They hated me. <laughs> and he said, I don't know what the deal is. I said, well, Vince, I've been on this TV up here for about a year. They all know me across this country. And he sends me back out on another tape, and it happened again. And for three weeks, that's, that's all they heard on TV was people booing me. <laughs> the tapes went back down in the States. <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah, about three more weeks later, the, 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 all the heels was complaining. Mike Sharp would hit me, and they'd cheer for him. So, <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> Morocco had to work with me. He come back. He said, "This guy's killing us, man. We can't get any heat. Everybody's cheering every time we hit him. They cheer for us." And you know, the guys wanted, you know, they wanted to keep some heat. And uh, it was when heat meant something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, God bless him. Jesse Ventura came up with the idea of the 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 one eight hundred vote of confidence for the honky tonk man, and we Daddy. got it, we got it switched right away. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> and from then on, the, from then on, it was cakewalk. It was what I had designed it because I, I had never thought this thing up to be a, a, a good guy at all. Never. I can do it now. It's easy to do now, and the fans love it. 
but before no i could i had no idea how to do it yeah and after a while everybody becomes a baby face you know larry hagman jr ewing becomes a baby face after yeah. so long yeah. you know it's not yeah. it's not that anything changes it's like the fans just say you know what that guy's entertained me for so many years i'm gonna cheer him now <laughs> yeah, you go. You game. go by. You know, I'm a, I'm on a lot. I'm on an eight year rotation with WWE. So about every eight years, they call me. <laughs> so first eight years, and then I go back over there and just uh, do this Royal Rumble or something or something. I don't know what it was, and uh, and then maybe that was on about the sixteenth year. That's when Kane hit me over the head with a, Kane. Kane racked me with a guitar and dumped me over with a jumpsuit on. And so, uh, but when I went through the curtain, the people went crazy cheering. I mean, you're cheering like crazy. Uh, the first time on the eight-year rotation, I think John, that was with you in that Royal. Yeah, Rumble. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I wish I wish I had missed that eight-year rotation. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't I know what you did. Die, I don't you know what I don't know. I mean, Jerry might have more insight on this. I mean, that Royal Rumble, I don't know if it was designed for punishment for somebody or what, but I, I don't know if you had done something wrong or or or, or what, but. For, for the, if you stay out there more than 20 minutes, you've done something. They, there they, was a they, little, little payback involved there, Hawkins. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Hawk, you know what's the worst? You know what's the worst? He's hey, we're going to leave you out there for about 30 minutes, and then we'll get down to the final five. Okay, everybody leave. We'll go to the finish the final five. And you're like sixth. You're like, oh, come on. I'm filler. Yeah. So, Jerry, you would like this story. So we're sitting back there, and uh, – John's been out there now. He, he, I walk over and sit down where Barry's at. This thing got started. And John's been out there about, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. He's gassed pretty good. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't really ready for this at all. Because no. him and Barry was together back then. And I don't know, maybe they was going to test you, John, to see if you were ready for that push they were going to give you. But uh, uh, Barry was sitting there. I sat down beside him. He said, when are you on? I said, I think I'm about 18 or 19. He said, look at Bradshaw out there. He said, man, he's he's really puffing. He said, when you get out there, lean on him. <laughs> he said, lean on him good. I said, really? I said, man, I don't know if I need to do that. Boy's in bad shape. <laughs> he said, no, nah, I'll do it. So I went through the curtain. I went straight to Bradshaw. He was laying down on the bottom rope, kind of turned up sideways with his head near the second rope. And I put both hands right in his guts and I just pressed all my weight on him. I said, Barry said, lean on you. And all he could do was cuss a few little cuss words about what he was going to do to me if he ever got out of there. And, uh, only we laid on him for about a minute or a minute and a half because the next person to come out dumped me out. I was gone. I, I, was, I was in and out. They, they disposed of me real fast. I came back and Barry, Barry was just, he was tickled to death. He said, what do you do? What do you do? I said, he's going to be, he's going to beat the shit out of me. He's what's going to happen now. <laughs> <laughs> but John, John, John stayed in there and he stayed that long. You're either going to win it or they, they don't want, want you to have a heart attack. So, but anyway, <laughs> he came back through the curtain. He didn't say anything. He comes straight to me and Barry and started cussing us. So, <laughs> but anyway, that's how we, we how we got to know each other that's we had our, <laughs> we, we had a, a very personal meeting out there in that, yeah. thing that night <laughs> okay <laughs> Augie said at one point he goes fight back i said i can't put it. <laughs> 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 so the, on the next rotation uh i you know i'd been away for another eight years and uh, uh jim called me jim ross called and said uh i was down i, I had I was going to be down there in, in Louisiana anyway, in New Orleans for a monster truck show. And uh, he, Jim Ross called and said, you want to be in the Royal Rumble? I said, well, where is it? I did, you know, when you're not working there, you don't really keep up with it too much. I said, well, where is it? I, I said, cause I'm, I'm in uh, New Orleans for a, for a monster truck thing. He said, well, it was right there in New Orleans. I said, oh, when are you there? I said, well, I'm there Friday night. He said, well, we can stay over and we'll do that thing on Sunday. Okay. So anyway, my wife said, well, what, what do you think you're going to do? I said, I so, said, well, they either be short and I'll get out of there and it'll be okay. Or are they going to keep me in there for about an hour and try to make me have a heart attack? You know, if you hadn't been doing stuff in a long time and working right. independence, you're not in, you're not in WWE shape now. I'm going right. to tell you, because right. I mean, that's one thing about it. When you're working in WWE, you're going to have to, you know, you got to move around a little bit. You can't be out there walking around doing nothing. 
So uh, I said, they said, they either going to get rid of me early and they love, I'll be happy and come home with a sack full of money or, or <laughs> I'll go home in the casket. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, they, they did the deal where Kane wrecked me with the guitar and I took that little bump. It was, it was fine. And the people enjoyed it and it was fun. And, you know, uh, Kane hit me with a guitar and it didn't send me to rehab or anything. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh, you know where uh -huh. I'm going. John, you know where I'm going with that, but we'll leave it right there. <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly where you're going. With that. I, I, I don't, I don't. So let's take it a little bit further. <laughs> no, no, that's don't worry about it. Okay, all well, right. Well, there's, okay. there's been there's been there's been re, there's been reports that I send people to rehab, and when I hit them with a guitar, and uh, I hit a lot of folks, and nobody. There's only one person went to mul multiple rehabs, so yeah, we'll, we'll uh, multiple rehabs. Multiple yeah, rehabs. I, I, I know where you're at. I, it, I'm old, and it takes me a little while to catch on, but I caught on. <laughs> so let, let's digress then. Let, let's go back. You you had some classic masters with some all time greats, and you're included in those are all time greats, so it wouldn't be like that. With the Macho Man and, and Ricky the Dragon Seaboat, uh, your your little your your run with 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 uh, with Macho Man, did 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 he come to you with a uh, 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 file full of papers and and with this is how we're going to do it? Because you because you because you're one of those guys like we uh, John and I are. You just you call it out there, man. I I you know I didn't know anything about. The, I had been. You know, I before I went to Randy, I was with the, the fellow that was doing the multiple rehabs. So, <laughs> of course, going into rehab multiple times. So, uh, you you had to have a lot of fillers in there. Well, yeah, I had a lot of I had a lot of people like uh, 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 the Crusher they bring in and uh, 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 you name them. Uh, they did eventually just drag them out of there. But uh, uh, wherever that we needed a substitute, you know how that was. Uh, right. that you guys do if you, if somebody can't make it, they give you a substitute, and then you lose. I got beat every night in every town, every <laughs> night in every town for for all the twelve weeks that the, my 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 guy was going into rehab. But anyway, <laughs> I finally finished up with him, and uh, I got this thing with Macho, and I just fell into that Jerry and and, and John. And it, people don't, sometimes they don't want to understand it or believe how it happened, but some things just happened in this business. And I just happened to walk down the hallway and Hulk and, and Vince was talking and uh, uh, Hulk just, he, I just, I was coming from an interview or something over there. At, uh, uh, we were in uh, Buffalo at that war memorial and just walking out a little hallway and Hulk said, what about this guy? And Vince, you know, did his little, well, maybe so. He said, I'll let you guys talk, and he walked away. And then Vince told me about uh, Ricky wanting to, to uh, go away and take some time off, and, and, and Butch wasn't there, and, you know, it was getting to be the 11th hour, and they need to put the show together. And he said, uh, you know, I need to put the belt on somebody. And he said, I need somebody to run with this thing. It's got to be in the town. It can't be sitting in somebody's house. I said, well, Vince, if you give me that belt, I'll run with it. I said, that's my deal with you. If I, if I, if I work, you pay me. If I don't draw, you ain't got to fire me. I'll go home. And, uh, that was our deal. And we went out that night and I got the belt from Ricky and then Ricky did come back and work some return matches with me. And they were really good. I enjoyed working with Ricky. Uh, it was, you know, the kind of stuff I, we didn't have to call a lot. He, he, he had, Ricky had a good ear. Ricky was like Brad Armstrong and like Ricky Martin. He was like, like uh, Barry Wyndham had that good ear. You could call something, you could whisper it all the way across the ring and it could hear it. And uh, he was very, very good to work with. So I had a few matches with him and, and some return stuff. And then uh, well, I went to the Macho Man. But I had never heard about the paperwork and all that. I, I didn't I didn't know that because Ricky didn't, they, Rick really didn't <laughs> let all that cat out of the bag till later on. You know, here a few... But Randy did have to have everything laid out, everything, every night. I didn't see paperwork, but we had to go over it every night. I mean, if we had two shows, Sacramento on a Saturday afternoon in San Francisco that night, he was saying all the things, the only thing difference was the length of the, the, the walk ramp to the ring from the backstage, <laughs> nothing changed, you know, I mean, but anyway, I got to the point where I'd hide from him. <laughs> and, uh, 
he'd come looking. I'd see him. I'd go in the bleachers and peek between the bleachers and watch him. And I'd see him. He's walking. And he's all wise. And he's, he'd go to Jimmy Hart. Where's that old man? And, well, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and then the music would, I, all of a sudden, I would reappear right at the curtain. And he didn't have time to talk about it. <laughs> so we'd just go out there and do them. But I found out that if it was much better and we we worked a lot better if I let him come and tell me and let's let's put it together. And because I knew if something needed to change, I could change it anyway. It was no big deal. But he liked to have it structured. And I understand later on that Randy would get so deathly nauseated before these Saturday night main events and the WrestleManias mm -hmm. that he would just have to lay down and he'd be sick and throwing up and it was like, man, they, they call Randy the greatest worker of ever. It's like, man, come on here. You know, I mean, Harley Race ain't going to be over there puking because he's got a big match tonight. You know, Andre, Andre's not going to. He's going to have some wine. He's going to be relaxed. But anyway, Randy and I, the gears clicked because I had worked in Puerto Rico and Randy was partly trained by Tom Ernesto. And so was Dutch. And I had worked a lot with Dutch. So I understood their style. They, they worked fast. They worked a lot of spots. They did up and down a lot. Not a lot of selling. Not big comebacks. Randy, I always used to watch Randy when he was healed. He'd get the heat, bing, 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 and get a baby face, get a comeback. He'd tie himself in the ropes. Man, just kill a comeback. But <laughs> anyway, that's – so I understood Randy. I understood how he worked, and I could work with him. And I made it work. And we never had any problems. It was strictly business, Jerry. It's hard to believe that you have a run with Randy. And I made a lot of money with Randy. I enjoyed it. Uh, you never knew what you were going to get. If he was going to be macho man, was he going to get upset because somebody whistled at Liz? Or he let little things bother him. The little things bothered him. And, and, but he was meticulous and professional. I never had a drink with him. I never had a restaurant. Sat down with him. Never hotel nothing it was strictly locker room business and it worked out very well it worked out great yeah was yeah he the and same then way, was he the same way with promos that he was nervous like matches because he, he was a great promo guy as, as well as a great wrestler he, he he was not he was not so hyper on his before his promos he was okay he could sit there and be still and everything uh but randy i don't care I saw it when I went to WCW, Randy was there. We meet in that little hallway down there, that little studio. And 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 he I said, Hey, Macho Man, he went, Ooh, you get your old man. And he he just shook my hand, but he was waiting to see if my other hand was going to the knife in the back. It's like, yeah, man, <laughs> we sweated the same sweat and the same blood, brother. I, I, I just want to be your friend. I didn't, you know, I'm just here. But he was he was really wound up tight. Well, I, I sometimes, sometimes I'd wonder how he would have been if I had a room next door that I could have listened to his real voice. I mean, was he always? Ooh, yeah. <laughs> we well, always wondered that about Backlund too. You know, his back yeah. really wound this tight all the time. Or does he get into a all room the by time and just become all a calm, normal? I, back I never, was always like that. I, I never saw him other than being Macho Man. That, that's yeah. I mean that was it. And, well, uh, Honky, you you saw you remember how we used to do promos at that time. We used to rent a hotel room at at, at a hotel and and uh, and do uh, have a whole day there just to run. You know everything was inserted in, in the tape back then. Okay, you're in, you're in uh, Joplin, Mrs., uh, yep. Missouri. You're in uh, you're in Fairbanks, Alaska. You're in L.A. You're in New York City, and you go in that day and you do promos. I remember Randy could not do a promo. I would, I'd have to order those big hotel, you know, one or they, two or three gallon coffee uh, thermal things. And Randy would stand by that coffee machine and just down coffee like like you and I down a beer <laughs> and, until he was hyped up enough to go out there and cut a promo. And it would take him probably 10, 15 takes to do one one minute promo. I, I watched him. I had seen him. I knew Randy before. I hadn't hadn't worked with him, but I knew of them because I had worked in some Kentucky towns with Nick, who was they used some of that talent 
uh, Nick had some independent promoters that ran some towns up in Kentucky, and and that's the first time I met uh, uh, One Man Gang. One Man Gang was 18 year old kid, long hair and, and everything up there. He was going as a uh, Crusher Broomfield, and then he became the One Man Gang later on. But Randy and and Lanny and and I had worked with Lanny once up there on the independent show, but Randy was high strung even back then. He was not personable. He, he just was, he didn't have that personality and, uh, but he didn't, he would not hurt you in the ring. You didn't have to worry about that. No. I trusted Randy and no matter what, except that, that dead gum elbow. Now that thing off the top rope, that thing hurt. That hurt. <laughs> I mean, he not, he not, listen, when you knock Mike Sharp out and Mike Sharp asked me, he said, how is it? I said, well, you're going to feel it. And he knocked Mike out on TV taping. So if you knock Mike Sharp out just by coming off with an elbow, what would happen is your head would fly up and fly back down. And Randy would put his whole body on you. Randy didn't want to land with his body, with his shoulder on the mat. So he would make sure his shoulder and his body hit your, hit your chest. So, yeah, it was like the snooker splash, you know. <laughs> that snooker splash, he hit me one time. It was like somebody stomped a tomato. Because he had, he, we, we did a leapfrog spot, and he come back and gave me the chop, and he chopped me right across the nose. So he busted my nose, had blood out of both nostrils, picks me up, slams me, then splashed me. The blood hit people on the front row. And Earl Hebner said, Dad, you only look like somebody stomped a tomato. <laughs> <laughs> tomato. People don't realize heels are the ones that have to take all those fists. You know, people talk about Snooker's big fall. <laughs> Morocco's the one they landed on. You know, I understand. I was at the bottom of Eddie Guerrero off the top of the cage. We were like, oh, that was fantastic. Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. we're, the, we're the ones they land on. Yeah. Yeah, lay there when they say don't move. And it's like, right, right. Man, should I, what should I do here? But anyway, yeah. But yeah, the, uh, you know, Jerry, but the, that was Randy. Uh, Randy was, uh, uh, we did great things together. And, uh, and uh, uh, you know, he went on to do great things. And, from what I understand, they always had plans for Randy uh, from day one. Vince had plans for him. Well, we uh, we think back and think, well, Ted Ted DiBiase was going to get the get the title shot and do all that. But uh, from what I understand now, uh, Randy was figured in on that all the way through, and uh, that's Vince's direction he wanted to go. He went with it, and uh, it worked out. It worked out for the company. Worked out for Randy too and Liz. When did the Intercontinental Championship become such a big deal? I don't, I'm not talking about the title itself. I'm talking about your run. When did it, when did, because everybody, you know, when you have a run with a title, you know, eventually that, that run itself can become a big deal. Your run became one of the biggest deals of all time and ended up making a star that went on to headline WrestleMania because yeah. of the run you had. When did it start becoming a big deal? Well, I knew if I had the opportunity, John, I knew I could get over because I had gotten over in Pensacola with this thing. I'd gotten over in Canada and across Canada with it. I knew what I said earlier about these little key words and phrases, these little actions, how to stand and how to look at the camera and how to, how to strum that guitar. And, and, and just, I, I knew how to do it. And I knew working my Southern style of nobody in WWE Early, early on, and Jerry will tell you this, and you might remember I watched it, the guys wouldn't drop down and beg. I mean, no one would get some heat, take a bump, and then, you know, drop down and say, please, don't hit me to a baby face. They, they, everybody wanted to stand up and fight. Heck, I'd drop down and beg, man. I'd beg off, and the more I'd beg, the more they want to kill me. And uh, so as I started picking that steam up with the belt, because no one expected me to win, and, and that was, a, you know, that right there made that championship that made that intercontinental belt that night because it had been on a Ricky steamboat. It had been on Randy had the belt almost as long as I did. He was only like three or four days shorter than what I had it. And Tito Santana and, and Pedro Morales, and Greg uh, Valentine, uh, Don Morocco, uh, Pat Patterson, this, the belt had been on some really like, you know, good guys in the ring. And here I was, a song and dance man. I'm out there looking like Elvis and, 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 and all this nonsense. And, and it just made, it made losing the belt mean something to those people. They didn't care if Jerry Briscoe came out there and beat me. They didn't care if the guy on the front row could beat me. They just wanted me to be beat and not have that belt anymore. And I, I made it that way because I would brag about it. 
because I was losing every night. Like I said, when when my 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 opponent was uh, gone and uh, gone away uh, in rehab, multiple rehabs, I was losing. And <laughs> and Jerry, you guys know this. If you're if you're beating somebody every night, it's hard, man. It's hard to keep that heat, especially if you're a heel. Yeah. You you can't beat a heel every night and just expect him to come back and draw. But the thing was, Vince kept me good on TV, and that was my deal. That's the deal anything, right there. I'll do anything you want, Vince. Just keep me good on TV. And he, he's promised me that. And uh, every time I'd go back on TV, all right, here I am, me, Gene. I'm the greatest of all time. I still got the belt. No one can beat me. I walk in the streets. I can't even find a fight. And every eight-year-old said, boy, if he walked down here, I'll, I'll beat him. I won't. And I made it to the point where it didn't matter who I was put against. We could sell the place out because they didn't care. They wanted me to lose. And when I did lose it and the way I lost it, it didn't hurt me at all. That's the one time you do a job in the clean in the middle of the ring and it doesn't hurt your heat at all because I came right back and said I got screwed out of it. And, and me and the warrior weren't for another three months and sold out everywhere with me trying to get the belt back because people were afraid I was going to get it again. <laughs> right and it you know what it made him a star uh it changed oh. it's vince wanted this vince told me he wanted to do this <coughs> plan months ahead of time and uh i said are you are you crazy man <laughs> <laughs> he said no he said i see something in him i know you guys don't but i do and he said i'm going with him he said hogan's wanting to go to hollywood and i need somebody and he said i'm going with him i said well, I'll tell you what, man, I don't know what you're thinking, but anyway, I'll do whatever you want. So anyway, then he said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to need to do this. And he said, I'm going to need some return matches. I said, oh, God, please. <laughs> he, said, <laughs> he, said, he said, Wayne, just work with a guy on the front row. I don't care. Just get him over. And so I went out there and we worked return matches. And uh, I ended up getting him to where he could go about, about, eight, about eight, ten minutes with some good stuff that he could do. And then Rick Rude took him. I think Dino Bravo took him maybe after that. Then Rick Rude took him. And then uh, Rick Rude taught him how to work. Because cool. Rick was a Rick was a good technician. Rick yeah. was a good worker in the ring. Did, did you guys <coughs> see it in, in Warrior? Did, what did you guys think about Warrior before that? Did, I know you obviously this big muscle guy, but, but it, he looked like he was getting over. Did, what did you guys think? Well, you uh, John, you know how it is sitting around there. You 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 get lost in your own stuff there because uh, uh, you you you've watched somebody else's match, but they were they was not pushing him. He was in matches with Hercules out there, and and God bless him. Herc was a great worker and easy to work with in the ring. But you know, Herc was a, a big old boy too, and and you know they all had their vitamins and everything, and 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 they were equal in strength, and and they would go out and just just beat. I mean, they just beat each other up. And me being, you know, like, I don't know the guy, and I really hadn't watched a lot of it. I go to Herc, and I said, Herc, how is this guy? And he says, well, you dread getting up in the morning. <laughs> and I said, what, what do you mean, dread getting up in the morning? He said, because you know what you got to face that night. <laughs> I oh. said, I'm going to dread getting up because I know what I have to face at night. He says, yeah, that's all I needed to know. And I went, oh, okay. And then I found out I started dreading getting up in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I mean, it was rough now. It was rough. I'll tell you what, I'd been in with a lot of guys. I'd wrestle Luth Fez and he worked me over real good when I was just a kid. And, you know, he taught me a lot and he taught me how to defend myself. And and and, 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 and Al Costello beat me up pretty bad and and uh, worked me over for about three or four weeks as a young guy. And and then Billy Robinson worked me over. And of course, your guy in, in Korea, he worked me over pretty good. And, you know, and some of them Japanese boys, when I was over there six weeks, I didn't get to work with Jack. Jerry, Jack was on that tour with me six weeks over there. I mean, some of the Japanese boys is easier than Killer Brooks, but but on that champion on that champion karma, you had to work, you had to work with everybody. So you know, he's working with the good Japanese boys. You work with Jumbo one night, and the next night you might have have Momoto or somebody, and and it was would be like pulling teeth. You'd have Haku and he'd work over pretty good too because he was just a young boy. But anyway, uh, this warrior now, that was a different game. <laughs> that was a whole different ball game. This boy was rough. He didn't know anything. 
I was I, I was I was a bottom line. He just he didn't didn't know anything. And I, I always you know at that time Wayne I was if you remember I was doing the local promotion down here. Yeah. And yeah. and he had he had more heat backstage with the guys yeah. than he did, you know, as, as, as any as anything. Even the fans they they hated it because they felt like he shortchanged them when he went out to the ring. But the guy was giving it a hundred percent of what he had, and the people could feed off of that. Yeah. And I think that's the energy that that what pulled him through it definitely wasn't the skill set that he had, but it was the energy that yeah. he portrayed when he went to the ring. Yeah, I wasn't going to go out there and, and fight with him. I, I mean, that's ain't my cup of tea. I told you, I'm a song and dance man. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm going to drop down and beg. And so, <laughs> but, Our but uh, a lot of guys just didn't, they didn't understand him. They didn't understand that, that, you know, you, I think somebody like Harley, Harley Race could, Harley Race could take a, a paper cup and go out and have a match. Somebody like Harley could have had this guy for, for two months. And, and made him into something. But who knows, when you make him into something, the people might have might not have liked him at all. I think they might have, I think the people like this 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 uh, unpredictability that he had and this energy and yeah. I, I, the best part about it was this. He would run so fast that he'd go through the curtain. You know how monsoon would go. Oh, go, go, and just scream so loud at TV. Oh. This warrior, he tore the curtain down and all kind of stuff was hanging <laughs> up in it. All, it, was, it was a mess. But anyway, he would run to the ring as hard and fast as he could. And he'd slide in there and he'd run across some rope, bing, 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 bing. And then he'd be purple. <laughs> he'd just be hurting. And he was lay there and I have a chin lock on him. I'd be left pressing in his guts like I did old John Bradshaw. <laughs> and uh, he was so... And he would start begging me, he said, please, please, help, help me, help me. Hey, I'd just get up and give him a couple of kicks, dance a little bit, and come back and lay on him again. It was, I, I mean, if he was, he, he, he blew himself up before he got in the ring. So that made it easy. You know, when a guy gets blown up, he's pretty easy. You can yeah. ask Bradshaw about that. <laughs> That's for <laughs> sure. <laughs> anyway. He's easy when he's not blown up. Right? Anyway, it's like, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, what was his name? Uh, 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 the coach from Green Bay Packers, the old guy, uh, Vince Lombardi. He Vince. said fatigue, uh, uh, Vince Lombardi, he said fatigue makes cowards of everybody. And it does. Fatigue will make you a coward. And, and you're pretty easy to, to handle when you're worn out. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Don't you get the ideas, Jerry? <laughs> I still owe Honky Tonk for what he did to me. And but anyway, I owe anyway, Barry Windham for suggesting it. Yeah. I got him. Uh, I finally got him to do a few things, and and it, it, he would hit me so hard in the side of the head with his fist, and that that forearm of his, that thing was purple with veins sticking out of it, and it's like a rock. I mean, his whole body was two hundred and eighty pounds of nothing, but I mean, solid and just cold sweat coming off of him, cold sweat. Have, the vitamins was working, I guess, I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> whatever it was. And uh, But anyway, he would hit me so hard in the head, and I finally told him, I said, Jim, you just can't hit me like that. I said, I'll do anything you want out there. I'll try my get to do the best I can. But my head has, was starting to swell like a softball and hadn't gotten mushy. And I said, if you ever, pick, if you ever hit me like that again, I'm going to go down and not getting up. So we were in Denver, about 20,000 over there. Bing, 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 I had him set up. Now, I was the one who got him shaking the ropes. I got him doing the Strongbow stuff. That was, I got that up from Strongbow when I worked with Strongbow in Puerto Rico. Strongbow was down in Puerto Rico and they sent him down after he was rehabbing his knee, he had the scope on his knee and they were gonna bring him back to New York. So he was down there, so I had to work with him. And he, he would shake his leg, shake his one leg, second leg, shake an arm, shake this, shake the rope, shake the rope, and bing, 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 start his comeback. I gave that to Warrior because it was easy for him to do. It was easy. But then he would shake him so hard, he'd blow himself up. I said, you got to learn to work with the rope. Let the rope, you know. <laughs> but anyway, I got him to do that. And he, then we had this thing going, bing, bing, bing. And he, the crowd was into, he hits me in the side of the head. I went down, Jerry. With all his might, he pulled my hair to try to pick me up. 
and he was pulling my hair. It was like plucking a chicken. <laughs> and just dropping my hair, but I would not get up. I, I clenched to the mat, and he just felt the people just die. And I got back to the locker room. I said, Jim, I told you don't ever hit me like that again. He said, I'm so sorry. He said, I don't know what. He said, I'll never hit you like that again. I said, well, how would you feel out there? He said, I felt like I was naked in front of all these people. He said, they, they shit on me. I said, yeah, they did. I said, you got to remember, it takes everybody in that ring to work this match. And I said, if you hurt me, you're out there by yourself. And so he never hit me like that again, ever, never, ever. Now, he did pick me up by my Niagara's and by my throat like I was a dumbbell. <laughs> and he would do that. And I finally got him to know, you know, I, I said, Jim, you can squeeze my throat, but you got, you don't be squeezing me down between my legs, okay? <laughs> <laughs> This, he was strong now, I'll tell you. But anyway, he was doing that. I was telling Jimmy Hart every night, oh, God, he's killing me, Jimmy. He's killing me. Oh, baby, oh, baby. It's, okay. it's lovely, baby. It's lovely. <laughs> okay. So I go to Jim. I said, listen, Jim, just put your hands on me. I'll climb up your body. Don't worry. I did it once, twice in the locker room. I said, just do it. A couple of times we had it worked out. And I said, okay, Jim, tonight, here's what we want to do. I had the longest runway that we had in one of the buildings, like San Francisco or somewhere out there. Had a long, like, um, Oakland, California, long walk. I picked the building. I said, tonight, let's work this spot where I want Jimmy Hart to come in there and I want you to pick him up, okay? And I want you to tow him, pick him up and tow him all the way back to the curtain. And I set it up. And I said, Jimmy, here's what we want to do. Okay, yeah, baby, yeah, baby. So we work to finish, boom, Jimmy jumps in, hits him with a megaphone, Jimmy begs off. I said, Jimmy, you, you start cowering away, go all the way back to the curtain. I said, Jim, you just stalk him now and take your time. I said, when you get him at the curtain, don't, I said, pull him back, pull him from the curtain, take him all the way to the curtain now. And I said, didn't pick him up. And I said, now you gotta remember, Jimmy's not a wrestler. You're gonna have to grab him by the throat and you're gonna have to grab him like this. I said, I want you to bring him all the way back and walk real slow. I want, yes, said, Jim, you got to let everybody, <laughs> everybody has to see it and go real slow. And he had Jimmy up there and he had him by his Niagara's. He had him by the throat. So he's got you by the throat. You can't squeal. And you need to squeal because he's squeezing something else. <laughs> and, he, and he throws Jimmy in the ring. And I come at him and I swing, bing, bing, bing. He does the finish on me, one, two, three. Jimmy's laying over in the corner and I roll over. I said, well, how was it? He said, oh, Jesus Christ, he almost killed me. Oh, 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 oh. I don't know how you did it. I don't know how you're doing it. I don't know how you did this every night. I said, it's lovely, baby. Everything's great. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I had to do it. I had to do it. It was one of the greatest putovers for a title change in history, in wrestling history. It made uh, The Ultimate Warrior. Did you know right away, I mean, you know, sometimes when you're out there and you feel it, I mean, it just, you, you know you hit a home run. Did you know right away that you'd, you'd hit it? John, I knew, Vince, this is the one time Vince let me, he, when he told me about doing it, doing the thing six months ahead of time, I said, I need to do it my way. I said, it needs to be fast. Because I know if you're going to beat a heel, a good way to beat a heel, and especially when it's a good hot deal, is beat the heel fast. Beat him quick. One, two, three, and all of a sudden it's a shock effect. And I said, it needs to be fast. He said, however you want to do it. And we went along there, and, and as we had those four or five or six months of, of, of matches together leading up to this thing, uh, well, not quite that long. We had about, a, I guess we had about a month of, working you know work the bugs out before you get there because i was still working with randy i think at the time and and so i go to him and i said jim here's how i want to do it and i told him and i said let's do it this way and i said i think it'll work and nobody nobody else knew no one knew i told vince I, he said how are you going to do it so i know what the time is i said i'm gonna go out let me go out and do this interview and i'm gonna just you know Later, talk some stuff here and say that I'll take anybody to wrestle. And then when I say this, hit his music and uh, he's going to run in and we will we'll do it. 
He said, okay. But I had set the stage. I knew if we did it fast and I knew he could do this, he could hit the ropes, do that flying tackle, elbow, shoulder butt of his was really good because he could get way up in the air with that thing. And if you watch it back, he was planed out all the way up. He was as high as my head. Hits me with a shoulder block and down I went. He hits the ropes, comes and gives me that splash. One, two, three. But I set the stage by the interview when I went out there saying that I'm here to wrestle. I don't care who it is. I, I came here today. I want to wrestle anybody. I don't, you get me somebody out here to wrestle. And Monsoon and, and Superstar Graham put it over really well in commentary. Oh, man, you shouldn't be saying that. And all of a sudden, his music hit. The people were in shock that it was his music because they were probably expecting, you know, a Bret Hart or somebody like that. And he hit the ring and didn't slow down. Bing, 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 bing. One, two, three. It was over in like 13 seconds. And it was it. And he was a star. It made him. Wow. It helped the company. It did what they wanted. It, it made him an overnight sensation is what they needed. And didn't hurt me because I came back. I still had heat. Didn't, didn't bother me. You know, it's amazing as a heel. You know, you, you can get beat all you want. It, it's just, it's how you get beat. You know, it, you, you, you can win, but it's how you win. You know, when you lose, you say you brag about how you won and you brag about holding the title for so long. And they, you, the fans are going, wait a minute, he didn't beat anybody. And that's the heat in it. You know, there, there's not everybody can be a chicken shit heel, but the ones that can, it's the greatest heel in the world. The, the, the thing that gets me now is you look back at it, and the people were so happy that I lost. And then they had buyer's remorse. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah. We wanted him to lose, but not to this guy. <laughs> I mean, they liked the award, but they didn't. They, I mean, they weren't in love with him. But he, he ended up then having to, uh, to go on. And, 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 and the fans were behind him all the way because of, he had a big victory. He had a victory no one else could get. But, but yeah, they had a buyer's remorse on him because it was like, we wanted every, anybody to beat him, but not the warrior. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that's what we do to these fans. That's what, that's what this business is about. It's about manipulating their emotions. We have to control their emotions. We can't let them control us. And, and, and it's important. It's hard. It's one of the hardest things. I don't think you can really teach it to someone in a wrestling school or anything is, is how to control someone's emotions for that five or 10 or 15 minutes or like a, a Harley or Jack Briscoe for, for hours every night and, and the funks to control someone's emotions for an hour. You know, I could do it. I can do it easily for 10 or 15 minutes, but an hour, I don't know if I could do that. That's the real testament to someone and controlling emotions is what sells tickets. That's what gets people. I mean, the, the televangelists on TV on Sundays have been doing it forever. I mean, they control your emotions. And they get you to do things. Heck, I just mentioned earlier about the my pillow. He controls your. He got people buying them pillows and shoes and everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, Wayne, now the thing about it, you know, it takes a special, special mindset to be a heel. And, and both both of these guys that uh, I'm talking to now, John and, and Wayne here, honky tonk man, you guys wanted to be heels. That that was your desire to be a heel. A lot of a lot of guys are playing heel, you know, and even when they're great heels, they're still playing heels. But to have that mindset, like I, like you guys said, you can get beat every night of the week and lie about it the next week. And it's how you get beat, but you come back, you lie. Well, if it hadn't been for this, and you people know it, tell them the truth, you know, they, the baby face generally cheats, you know, and, and the heel. But uh, you guys, you guys were masters of being heels, and you got to want to be a heel. I studied the heels. I studied good heels. I studied the, the Don Fargo's, the ringmasters. Mm -hmm. Don was a Don Fargo could go out in the first match wow. just as a punishment. Sometimes Jerry uh, uh, Jerry Lawler would put Fargo on a first match just for, and, and Fargo would start a riot. He, he'd say, uh, you, "You do a 15 minute Broadway with this this kid over here." And Fargo would have people coming in the ring, knocking, he was <laughs> hitting right and left, have a fight, have a riot in the first match. He was that kind of a ring general in the way he carried himself, the way he did stuff. Uh, and I, and I, I watched him and I watched, I, I watched a lot of Sputnik Monroe and I learned a lot about, inter yeah. I learned a lot about interviews from Sputnik and I learned about high spots and taking bumps and, and things that Sputnik would do and how he would work. Sputnik was a fantastic heel. 
and 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 uh, he he trained this young black kid uh, Norvell Austin, which became oh, yeah. another great heel. Yeah. Uh, and I would watch those kind of people. And and when sometimes they'd have Lou Thez. Lou wasn't a heel very often. But when Lou was a heel, Lou was a good heel. And I would watch the Funks. The Funks were good heels. They they were just ring generals. Harley was fantastic at it. Harley Race was a great heel. I mean, he was just so believable in what he did and how he did it. But and, and I equate the this this boy Steve Regal, who, who the English fella, doesn't work yeah. anymore. But I tell you what, he wow. he, this, yeah. he was a good heel. He yeah. was a ring general. Everything he did meant something in the ring. He didn't waste motions, and that's what's important. People say, "Well, he didn't take any bumps. He didn't do this." Listen, if you got to take bumps, you're not. People aren't watching you. Oh. You get people have to really have to watch you. I understand now it's a different product. It's a TV product. It's a video game product. The, the whole business is different, but the, to really learn it and understand it, I think you have to go and train that way in that slow, methodical facial expressions, body expressions mean everything. Tom Andrews and, and, and uh, Jim Starr, I was working under a mask, and those two guys were two of the best mask guys in the world. They, they were the interns with uh, Ken Ramey, Dr. Ken Ramey. Dr. Believed, Ken Ramey, I, Dr. Ken. Yeah. I believed in those guys and, and I was working under a mask and I didn't know how to body language and stuff. And Tom Andrews and Jim Starr told me, they said, listen, if you're gonna work under a mask, they can't see your face. They can't see your hair flying around. Use your body now. Learn to use your body. And the body motions is what means a lot. It means as much as anything is when you take that one bump or you get kicked or you get punched and you sell that thing and you spin around and drop to a knee and pop back up and take another one. Yeah, I'd like to say even like Tom Ernesto and Jody Hamilton, a two two mask guy, yeah. man, that had more heat than any any guys that yeah. that, that that walked, you know, because yeah. just because their body language and just the way they carried themselves and into the ring, you knew they were badasses when they got to the ring. When when you watch a, when you watch some of these guys that's been under the mask. When they come out from under the mask, they're even, they're even better because now they got the face, now they got the hair and all these things that can help you. You know, just having the long hair flying around and the facial expressions means a lot, but that body language is what really does it. Hollywood learned how to do it because, uh, you know, if you watch the good, the good comedy routines and things like that from years gone by, body language is fabulous. Three Stooges were great at it. Yeah, you know, that's one of the reasons I always thought Rey Mysterio was such an, an incredible talent because he always worked under the hood, but yet Rey was able to get sympathy from the crowd with them not able to see his face. You know, it was just, it, it was just an amazing thing to watch a yeah. guy work under a it, mask. It's, it's, yeah, it's the body language because they have no face, they have no hair. They, 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 even when the head moves, it's, it's like it's moving in slow motion because it's just that one thing sitting there with a mask on it. It's difficult to learn how to work under a mask. I think if, if you can teach people to work under a mask, you can teach them how to work because then they learn how to do body language. Because it's hard to teach body language when, when, they, when they think other people are watching them, when, when they, you, people can see your face. If they can't see your face, you can do a lot of things when you're, when you're hidden. You know, <laughs> it's, like, it's like watching Randy from the bleachers. You can do a lot of things. You, can, you can deserve a lot when you can't. <laughs> you know some fun wrestling trivia sometimes you know uh, lita was once part of uh, godfather's girls you know when she was an extra and then she becomes this hall of famer and this great big star ddp was once your car driver at wrestlemania 6 right did did yeah. you uh did, did was ddp just starting in the business then and get, trying he, to get in or he you, had I, I suppose he was working then in, in florida around down there uh, the office there had then closed. I don't know what was going on. Jerry probably knew more about it. Yeah, uh, uh, DDP first called me. It would be 1981, I believe it was, 82. And when he was he, wanting he to get been, in the business, he was working at a bar at Fort Myers, Florida, and he was wanting wanting to get in the business at that time. And so that's about the time frame that he started. Yeah, he had he had been around for a while doing things and and. Uh, you know, uh, he had. I would. I probably would have done the same thing if, if you know, WWE had called me and said, "Listen, can you pick this truck up and drive it over here for us and be on this show?" And I probably back then, you know, wanting to be there and wanting to be part of it, I would have done it too. 
Uh, he didn't get the job then. He, they didn't even give him a tryout. They didn't even bother looking at him at all. Huh. And really? uh, so he just showed up. I mean, I, I would have done it too. I wasn't saying it was a bad thing. I was, you know, we all take jobs when we first start trying right. to break in any way possible. And it's funny, you know, you look at wrestling history about different stuff we have done over the years. And now all of a sudden these guys become hall of famers and, and massive stars. Yeah. But, they didn't, uh, he, they didn't even put him out there on like a dark match to set the cameras or anything. So, I mean, he, he got nothing. He got nothing, but the, you know, free, he, got, he got a free lunch and, the, you know, at catering, he got dried chicken bread. <laughs> 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 and our catering, our catering back in those days wasn't prime uh, five star restaurant catering either. It was marinara uh, sauce with a, with a baked chicken breast, and that was it. <laughs> I tell people this, and a lot of people don't believe it, John. I mean, you had they had nice stuff when you were there, but I'm going to tell you, <laughs> when we when we we didn't have catering, it was uh, for union only, and they we would go in and, and take the food from the because in up up on the east coast everything's union. And the union gets food. They get their food catered. They have to have all this stuff, like in Hollywood. And uh, so we would, we would all go in there and get that food and eat and, oh. and take it and grab us stuff and go. And uh, uh, Vince got word of it. So they put the sign on the door, said, uh, no wrestlers, union <laughs> workers only. Yeah, and, I remember uh, that. <laughs> and yes, yes. And we, we would still sneak in there and get food. And then the union guys, they said, what are you guys doing? Trying to sneak Why is that? And, the union guys went to bat for us said, look, if you guys want to eat in here with us, come on in. So we did. Vince couldn't stop it. He finally had to just open it up then and started to, you know, catering it and everything. So, uh, yeah, that's how it came about. The only time we got food was on that Thanksgiving Survivor Series. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and, and you had to eat it before it ended up in the food fight. <laughs> yeah that's the only time we got any food you know and then uh in the beginning it was not that not a, not a big deal but then he vince being vince you know he wanted to make it a big spread and bring your family and let everybody else see you you know how how he puts a show on and he can i mean vince can put on a good show now i'm gonna tell you that he he's first class when he wants to do something he does it right yeah absolutely uh with everything he does uh Hoggy, look, I, I want to thank you so much for uh, coming on our show. There's so much more to talk about from uh, Rockabilly to WCW, but I don't want to keep it forever. But thank you so much for coming. Well, I'll tell you, I, I can quickly tell you about uh, WCW. Please. I, I wasn't there long enough to learn the words to the song. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I went there. Jimmy kept bothering me and calling me and wanting me to go there. And then Flair, Flair calls me once and he's got Jesse Ventura sitting there and Flair's on the phone. He says, hey, we'd like to bring you in. I'd give you a tryout and then take a look at you. I said, well, damn, Rick. I said, you, because Jesse was on the phone first. Said, hey, uh, Flair wants to talk to you and uh, and everything. You might have a shot in here. I said, okay. So Flair gets on. I said, we'd like to bring you in. I want to get a, get a look at you and let you have a tryout match. I said, well, damn, Rick, you know who I am. you know me for 20 years. You know what I can do. I don't need to try out. I said, shit, if you want to see me, rent one of the WWE videotapes. So, but anyway, <laughs> that, that kind of died on the vine, and then uh, and then Rick kind of got moved out of that spot, and and then uh, the fabulous Eric Bischoff took over, and uh, and Jimmy kept pushing for me to come in, and uh, Hulk really was looking for support too, because he didn't know how it was going to be going there, and he would Hulk's kind of got it. He don't like to test out these 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 waters unless he knows how deep it is, and and uh, uh, so he wanted some some people around him that he knew that was good support that could, you know, that he knew could carry the, carry the ball if they needed to. And uh, I went in there and, and the first, very first time I met Eric Bischoff, didn't know him, never seen him before in my life. We was outside the studios there at Disney or Universal, one of them, and he, he walked up and I said, hi. I said, I'm Honky Tonk Man. He says, yeah, I know who you are. He said, I'm, I've never been a fan of yours. Never was a huh. fan of you again because I said, oh, well, I hope I can change your mind, Eric. He said, I don't think so. And he walked away. I called my wife. I said, I won't be here long. She said, what now? I said, well, the guy that signs the checks and gives out the contract said he's not a fan of mine. I said, yeah, but I'll see what I can do. And that was about it. And I never got a contract. And then they wanted to beat me on TV and right off the get-go. And I said, well, you know, I can't do that. I said, I'm not on the team right now. I said, you put me on a team, I'll be a team player, but I can't do that. He said, well, you did it for Vince. I said, 
that's an insult. You, you couldn't carry Vince McMahon's jock strap. And I walked out. I, I, I ain't gonna forget what that kind of stuff. No. But you ain't gotta say that. You ain't gotta say that. No. Well, Honky, we won't say that to you. Anyway, anyway uh, we won't let me say tell you about we'll, we'll, remind, we'll remind Eric Bishop about what you said. Yeah. <laughs> he, he is a friend of ours, so we will, yeah. uh, you know. Well, you know, Eric's Eric, so I, that's, that's just how he is. And I didn't know him then. I still don't know him, so I don't, that's how it is. It ain't the first time I got fired. It ain't the first time I quit. <laughs> I told Jim Raw, I told Jim one time, I said, Jim, you know, we got something in common. He said, yeah, what's that? I said, we've both been fired by the same company. He said, well, I've been More fired than... by both companies. I said, well, I have too. <laughs> but real quick on Billy Gunn thing. That just, you know what happened on that? Uh, uh, both you guys, I'll tell you what I thought happened. It drug on too long. I was out there every week for about a month, maybe even longer. And we still hadn't picked someone. We were still, I'm looking for the next thing. I'm looking for it. I'm looking for the next greatest center continental champion. And it just, it, I think it went on too long. It went four or five, maybe six weeks. And I really thought it should have been somebody new, somebody fresh, some younger guy that you could take. Billy was there and had been there quite a while and was established and then, you know, had been busted up the tag team. He was out doing singles in and they wanted to push him as a single. I think they could have without me. He probably would have done a lot better. I cast a big shadow there when I walked out with him and it was hard for him to overcome. And I, I, I would not have wanted to be in his position to be there trying to get over with a guy outside with a guitar and a jumpsuit who everybody, you know, they, they want to kill me and not paying any attention to him. And, and I understand that. And I think Billy understands it now. But it was difficult and they was not putting him in good stuff. And I wasn't with him on the road. I was only with him on TV. And I asked him, what are, you, what are they doing with you out here on the, in the, on the road? And it was in the summer back then when they were doing those shows up in the uh, Nantucket, all up through there, all those small shows, you know, with, you know the uh, circle. Uh, the, the Ford show, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, he said, I'm working, I'm doing jobs for Flash Funk and this kid, Rocky Maivia. I said, oh, I said, well, what match you got? He said, first match. So, I, But I knew right then, I said, that, that doesn't look too good. That's going to be hard to overcome. And uh, it just didn't work out. But yeah, then Billy, you know, Billy, yeah, Billy went yeah. on to do, you know, when they did the thing with DX and then and then they hit me over the head and fired me. That was it's the best thing that happened to them. And the best thing happened to me. I got out of there. I was done. They actually did fire me that night. I was done. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't tell me, but I wasn't on the booking sheet anymore. <laughs> yeah, and, and Billy, Billy had a great body. Billy was a great worker. Good guy, really good guy too. They just weren't doing anything with him at that time. You know, yeah, they, and Billy they took him from nothing, and they were beating him all the time, trying to find it, something for yeah, him. And then yeah. he decided to put him in something. It just it, it was it was too late. It drug right. on too. If they were going to do it, they should have done it like after the second week. I found him right away. This is the guy, and and then go with it. But it drug on too long until I don't think they really knew how what direction they wanted to go with him. Uh, he'd never done really single matches, and it was difficult on him. And I know because I had been in tag teams for a long time before I got into singles. It's hard when you've always been in tags to go out now and start working single matches. It, 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 it's, yeah. a, it's not easy. It's not an easy thing to do. And you know, uh, I don't think they expected anything out of him and Road Dog. They put them together, but they weren't really doing anything with either one. And all of a sudden, yeah. they, they literally became one of the greatest tag teams of all time. Yeah, you know, they, they did. Were, they were it, fantastic. But nobody it, it, knew they could talk. Nobody knew they could be the characters that they were. Yeah. You know, it ended up working out for everyone the best. You know, it, it really did. It, it, I got out of there. I was out of the shadows. I didn't care about being a manager, really, because it was just it was not my cup of tea. I didn't even know how to do it because uh, I had never been a manager of anything. I was always the guy in the ring leading the stuff and telling the manager what to do. I mean, I, I knew where to be and what not to do. But uh, when you got heat, it's like Bobby Heenan. Rick Root hated being with Bobby Heenan. I can understand it. I think if I had been with Bobby, I might never have gotten over it. Bobby took the heat from people. People wanted to see Bobby Heenan, the weasel, the weasel. And then Bobby turned and looked at him. And when you look at him, they weasel you more. So then there's the, the guy, your guy in the ring, they're not watching him. Sometimes a manager can overshadow somebody. And, uh, and I think that that, that was could have happened and I'm glad I'm I'm glad for Billy and I'm glad for Road Dog because they're they're both good talents that ended up doing great. And the DX thing just took off like crazy. 
And I, I knew when that girl, when China got involved in it, I, she was, I knew her from Killer Kowalski. I had, I had worked out with her a little bit. So I knew what she could do anyway beforehand. And her best move was Lawler wanted to bring her to Memphis. And I told Killer, I said, don't let that girl go there. I said, she'll end up quitting the business. And he didn't, he, he, he blocked it and kept her in WWE, which was worked out for her. You know, one of the I just know, I just know what they do in Memphis. <laughs> I know what they do with young folks down there. You know, I mean, it's, don't you know have a cousin do. there? Don't you have a yeah. cousin there or something? <laughs> I just know what they do to people. So, well, it was know, the same. It was the same thing that I knew what they did here in Florida with people like you. You know, you you gave them the same advice that I gave you. Basically, you don't want to go there. Yeah, this is, I told Killer. He said, "What do you think?" I said, "Don't do it, Killer. Don't let her go there." I said, "It's not going to work out." Now, just the way she looked and everything, and the people down, they would have. I mean, Lotter would have had a field day with it. I mean, it would have been good for them and for their business, but it would not. Have, it wouldn't have done anything for her. And I think the way it worked out for her was the best because she ended up being as good as the guys. And uh, yeah, it's a, it was a wonderful addition to DX. It was. It worked really, out really, really well. Make that was, group. Yeah. That was... And that's that's the whole thing about this business. When the gear uh, and, and Jerry asked me about about the Randy earlier. When you finally get the gears in there and they're clicking man the thing rolls along with no problems and, but it's really hard to get that combination of gears and vince's vince's uh you know he's still trying to find it now he, he don't have a rock he don't have a stone cold he don't have a hook he, he don't have a cena those people just aren't born every day no but when it comes together it, it's it's like you say it's music it, it's a it's a it's an orchestra out and there go, you know, and it'll run and, and that, machine, beautiful. that machine it'll, it'll run for a long time yeah, it'll but run for a long just, time it's hard man if we had if we could just find them yeah that's it oh well, Wayne, now we want to thank you again man this has been a, the time has just flown by here we appreciate you taking your time out from arizona is there anything that you you're doing that you want to you want to tell folks about that we're going no, to help I, you out I, just, I go out here and i do these comic cons you know I, I was with john here a couple of weeks ago on one and and he he just kind of ruined my whole weekend i came home and i saw my daughter's <laughs> texas a and m uh, backpack laying there and i wanted to go kick it because uh, <laughs> i thought about that about that three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars that I had donated over there to Texas A&M, he said it was to pay, uh, pay, uh, pay, uh, pay old Jimbo's uh, salary, and it's kind of just bothered me to death now. But uh, to think that I throw my money away like that, but she got a good education over there, and she's a doctor now, so I'm happy. Oh, but no, I, 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 I go out and do these comic cons and signings, and uh, I don't have a lot to do with the wrestling part of anything anymore. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's passed me by, and. Uh, and uh, I'm just, I don't have a lot of interest in it. I got to ask you this. Wes told me this story. He said he was on an independent show with you. And, 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 and I love this, by the way. So I'm not, not doing it to, to, to knock anything. Yet. But uh, you tell these guys, some of these guys, kid, you got one bump out of me. Use it wisely. And, he, you, you, <laughs> and so you're with this guy. And he bumps you at the very beginning of the match. You said, that's, that's it. it. That's, that's the old. last one you get. <laughs> I'm out of here. Yeah. Terry, Taylor, <laughs> Terry Taylor got excited one night. Bing, bing, bing. We was over there. And he, he's the red rooster. And he's a cocking and a walking. And bing, bing, bing. He picks me up and slammed me. And I went, why did you do that? And he went, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and he still talks about it today. <laughs> you only got so many bumps in you. And I, I always believe that the man that's still standing is the one that can uh, work on his feet, not off his feet. Oh. So uh, I, I did my share. I did my share when Larry and I were together working in Memphis, working for the Fullers, the over the top backdrops, over the top drop kicks, and on the floor slams, and uh, you name it, I did it. And I did my share of them. And I said, man, I'll be so glad when I get to be uh, Luthez's age, and, and 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 I can go out there and do a Luthez match. And then when I got his age, they want to kick me out of the business. Oh. <laughs> well, I, I want to leave you, but you, you got to do me a favor. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say something, and you finish it. Ladies and gentlemen, longest reigning, the most entertaining, and the greatest intercontinental champion of all time because he's... Thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry. I really appreciate that. I'm the honky-tonk man. And I'm cool, I'm cocky, and I'm bad. <laughs> oh, yes, I'm cool, I'm cocky, I'm bad. I'm coming to your town in a pink Cadillac. <laughs> Thank you.